So we're going to get right into it. Again, I want to welcome everybody to our Black History Month um, speaker series. Uh, this will be the final installment of the series uh, for 2022. And um, our guest tonight is uh, Mr. Cyrus Jones, um, former Super Bowl winning New England Patriot. Um, also spent time as a Baltimore Raven, uh, was also a champion at the University of Alabama, and um, won a few awards there that we'll get into as we go through the conversation. So uh, thank you for being with us, Cyrus. Uh, we appreciate having you with Baltimore County Government Recreation and Parks, and um, we're going to get right to it. Appreciate you having me, bro. Yeah, yeah. so uh, we got a few people online. You, you can speak to them, say hello, but I know I'm pretty sure they're excited to hear about how everything's going. Um, yeah, so Appreciate y'all tapping in. Yeah. So we're going to get right into it. Um, like Cyrus, we know that uh, you've done amazing things in your life. Um, you've won on every level. And um, I'm just here to give you your flowers and all that you deserve that comes with that because um, what you've done in your career is something that a lot of people don't achieve. And I'm here to give you your just due. I'll ask you questions that I feel as though, um, you know, pertains to your sport, your life, your career everything that you've been through personally and professionally that you're willing to share with us, um, just not only to motivate people, but give them an insight into who Cyrus Jones really is. So um, welcome, man. We appreciate you giving us the time tonight. And um, basically, you can just start with an introduction about yourself. Well, appreciate you having me, bro. You know, anytime you call, I'll do what I got to do to make it happen. But I appreciate you having me on. Um, everybody that came on the channel, I appreciate it. Um, hope y'all enjoy the interview. Uh, but basically, a little bit about me: born and raised Baltimore, Maryland, um, East Baltimore. Uh, raised by my mom and dad. Um, my mom was a teacher growing up. Well, I was born in 1993. Let's put that out there first. November 29th, 1993, 90s. Um, my dad, he was an athlete. Um, my mom, you know, went to school. She we both went to college. My dad played ball. Uh, at West Virginia, <clears throat> graduated from there. My mom graduated from Coppin State um, with a degree in education, and he had a degree uh, in physical education at the time, and then went on to uh, work for the state in the juvenile department. So that's what they did. Um, worked their bus off to take care of me. Uh, my brother, you know, I went to Leaf Walk Elementary School starting off. Um, then I went to Cardinal Sheehan Middle School, and from now I went to Gilman School, uh, where I spent um, my whole high school career. Okay. I'm going to stop you right there because I definitely want to get into a little bit more specifics and details about just that journey and transition. But, um, like, as far as you, um, you know, going to uh, recreation and parks route, when did, when did you kind of realize that you, had, you were kind of gifted as an athlete, um, as a child? Like, take us through that journey. Uh, when you first got your first football, your first basketball, your first pair of sneakers, you know, that 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 childhood phase where what led you to be who you are today. Yeah. Um I can't remember the specific moment, but you know, I feel like ever since I could walk, damn it, uh like two years old, my dad was hooping in college and that's all I knew at the time. I really wasn't even into football just be I mean I was two years old. Like I didn't know what football was, but I mean, it was clear that I was uh, interested in sports that my dad played ball. And as I got older, like I say, three, four, five, and I could really run around and they could see, you know, that I was aggressive and I was fast and had athletic ability and stuff like that. You know, my dad just took me down Chick Webb, signed me up, and that was it. That was a wrap from there. At five years old, that's when I started all my sports, baseball so, and basketball. Okay. So initially it started with basketball, right? Yeah. So, so back, would you say basketball was your first love? For sure. <clears throat> yeah. So, so yeah. as you make this transition, you know, you start, um, you start at five years old. Um, your dad, um, who we'll speak about a little bit later because he, he also plays a major role in a person that you are today. Um, he introduced you to the game, you know, took you down Chick Webb to one of the toughest, you know, gyms in the city, um, a well-respected and well-known recreation um, center that produced um, some of the top players that come out of Baltimore, whether it's in the NBA or college. Um, you take this journey to Chick Webb and you get in the gym. What is your, do you remember that feeling of those first thoughts? Yeah, I mean, 
it was all new to me, but I knew what I was there to do. I was there to hoop. It wasn't nothing right. different for me. I was still wet behind the ears as a kid. I ain't no organized ball yet, but go put the ball in the hoop. That's what I knew, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Gerald, like, I just remember the atmosphere. Like, it was it was gritty. Like, it was, I loved it, like, from the moment I got there. And that's, that became my home, and that's where I grew um, over the years, you know, playing AU and stuff like that until I went on the other programs. But the moment I got there, you know what I'm saying? It, you you already knew it was Baltimore basketball, and they were teaching it that way. Gerald and there, Coach Wise, everybody. Okay, like in your travels, you know, like myself, you know, we we talk a lot, and we speak about that term, like Baltimore guys. Like, what does that mean to you? Because you know, like in my travels, you know, like I was recruited on a smaller scale than yourself. You know, we'll we'll get into those stars later and things of that nature. But you know, going through the circuit and um, you know, playing basketball in the city, they always it's they look for certain type of guys and that term, like Baltimore guys, like what does that term, you know, mean to you specifically? Uh, specifically, meaning the first word I mean, I think about is just tough. Mm -hmm. um, just plain and simple. I mean, we wasn't going to back down from nobody, uh, no matter how big or small you was, we play the same way. And, you know, that's what the coaches I played for demanded of us at all times, just to go out there, one, give it 110% effort-wise, and then the other stuff will come later, but we're not backing down from nobody. So I think that's the Baltimore mentality, just never back down. Yeah, I, I would also have to agree with you. I know that, um, you know I mean, just in, you know, me going around and speaking to different coaches where I'm at in my life right now, um, when they come to Baltimore, they're looking for a specific type of kid for the most part. Like, they know they're going to be tough. They know they're going to be gritty. Um, they know they're going to have a sense of uh, mental and emotional toughness about them that, you know, depending on where you're from and other regions of the of the United States, they may not have that same outlook on life. So um, the term, you know, Baltimore guy is it, definitely a term and it, it means something to a lot of coaches around the nation. So um, as we take this next step, like um, you started out playing basketball, you said you started out playing baseball as well. Basketball was your first love. Um, and then you make this transition to playing football. As you're getting older, when do you realize, like, okay, like, I'm a little bit better than my classmates. I'm a little bit better than the guys that I kind of grew up with. Like, is it elementary school, middle school? Yeah, I definitely say it was middle school. It was kind of like when I first started. I mean, not to be, you know, cocky or anything like that, never. Uh, <clears throat> meaning, being, like, when I get asked this question, I'm just honest with people. You know, I knew early on, like, I was – I'm more gifted, I guess you could say, at that time, or just have a little bit more natural talent than my other peers mm -hmm. from like five, six years old. Okay. So would you say it's definitely the genetics, huh? I mean, I don't know if it's genetics or <laughs> I mean, I mean, of course, I mean, it, it has something to do with that. I mean, I think, I don't know, I think that just God just, this was what I was supposed to be doing, something in, the, in the athletics, and that was just my, 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 one of my gifts. You know, I was blessed with, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I mean, I'm thankful my my pops and my mom put me in a position to try to, you know, exploit those gifts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and I and I the reason why I mentioned um genetics, by the way, to everybody listening in, um, Cyrus's dad, who was uh, Diego Jones, at one point in time, he was he played on what is arguably one of the most uh, greatest high school teams ever. It's 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 arguable and debated all across the nation that um. The team that his dad played on and went undefeated at Dunbar High School is considered one of the greatest um, high school basketball teams of all time. Um, it, it, I think it's uh, your dad's class and Muggsy Bowles team, right? They were like the top two or three teams to ever, you know, um, really play high school basketball. And it's not like how it is today where you get a bunch of guys that transfer in and do all that kind of stuff. During that time in the 90s, if anyone's familiar with Dunbar High School, um, these are guys that all lived in the area, whether it was West Baltimore, or East Baltimore, they all were from Baltimore and they spent four years at the high school. And this team was, you know, ranked number one nationally and, you know, produced three or four NBA players, I think 10 to 12 high division one players. And it's something that's honestly a uh, accomplishment within itself. So that's why I mentioned um, Cyrus's genetics, because I know his dad had a, a mean jump shot and, you know, a trickle down to a son who, who turned out to be one hell of a player and every anything he ever touched. So um, just, just the reason why I mentioned that. But Cyrus, back to you. Like, we make this transition and, um, like, you know, 
as an athlete, you can see when you're better than other people and you you kind of know like, man, he can't beat me. He can't outrun me. He can't outcatch me. He can't outjump me. Um, you're in middle school. What is that next step for you when you know like, OK, yeah, I'm good. Eighth grade comes, you're going through puberty, a million things going through your head and you're ready to take this next step into high school. Um, how did you pick the decision on going to Gilman? Well, it's funny because um, and I think this might come up in, you know, later part of our conversation, but growing up Northeast Baltimore, Alameda, Northern Parkway for a ma majority of my childhood, I never even heard of Gilman until <clears throat> about, I want to say maybe I was 12 or 13, uh, and Coach Keith Cormanic and Coach Biff Poggi, uh somehow, some way, I still don't even remember how this happened. But I was so young and just worried about what I had to worry about at the time, just playing. But somehow, some way, they came to one of my rec games or got in touch with my, my Pee Wee coaches, introduced themselves to me and my parents and kept a relationship with us for a time period. And then I eventually just shadowed there. They set up a visit for me to uh, check Gilman out. And like I told you, it was crazy because I lived only right up the street. Right. Like I lived off the Alameda and Northern Parkway. Everybody know Gilman, Roland Park. I mean, Roland Avenue and Northern Parkway. So literally probably two and a half miles, maybe. And I had rolled by, but you know, never really went into that world or had a reason to go play ball over there or played any sports over there. It was a whole like foreign land to me. Like, I didn't even really know it existed. But just, you know, once uh, they began, I guess, recruiting me from rec ball, I stayed in contact, like I said, visited. And just the things that the school offered, you know what I'm saying, across all facets as far as, you know, academics, uh, athletics, and, you know, just getting a chance to be amongst different cultures socially and kind of be immersed in that. I, I, I really didn't understand it at the time being fully, but my parents, you know, of course, being smart and lead me in the right direction, you know, just uh, let me know, you know, that it'll be a good sacrifice for me and a good learning experience to come in here and get it uh, kind of a sneak peek on what the real world will be like, just because I'm not always going to be around, you know, people that look like me or talk like me or come where I come from. So it was good to kind of get that because, I mean, it definitely did help me out later on after high school. So let me ask you, like, I... I I do remember because, um, you know, I played against Gilman, you know, rest in peace, Coach Eaton. Uh, his son, he yes, he coached at Umbar, but his son also went to Gilman. And during just to, you know, update you guys during this time, our head basketball coach was coaching at Dunbar. His son is probably the top prospect in the country going to Gilman. And I have questions about that. And then also our football coach at the time, he also was one of the top prospects in the country. His father was our head coach for football, but his son also went to Gilman. So, when you was making that decision, decision to go to Gilman, I know for me being a Baltimore guy, like I always wanted to go to Dunbar. Like it was just something like I was from that area and, you know, I had to make a transition. I went to St. Francis first and then I ended up at Dunbar. But, you know, it's nothing like that to me, you know, like being a poet was something that it was extremely special for me. So how, like how did that conversation go? Because I'm pretty sure like you had if, if you had an option, like if you did not go to Gilman, was, was Dunbar number two? I know it. I'm a poet, bro. <laughs> I ain't a poet for real. So anybody who went to Dunbar, graduated from Dunbar, no disrespect to y'all, but you know what's up. Yeah, it's in, it's in the blood. <laughs> That's where I wanted to go, bro. I mean, from the time, you know, I started playing sports, especially when I got good at football. Mm -hmm. when I realized, you know, how good I was in football or whatever. And, you know, um, like I was already like in love with it just from watch, being around y'all, watching, being at practices, watching y'all hoop, and you know what I'm saying, just the the history and the uh, tradition and the camaraderie of the whole school and everybody that at that time I feel like it was they were still some of my best memories, you know what I'm saying, as a child and uh, getting a chance to go watch. Um, Nate and y'all play, you play because I was a running back at the time, so Nate was my favorite player. Irby. And I remember my dad used to take me to watch him play. And of course, just getting introduced to you. I knew you by then because you hoop. But before then, it was Nate. I used to love watching Sean far. Mm -hmm. I was like that. Um, that was later on. But 
it was that's why I wanted to go to school, bro. I wanted to be a poet, bro. Like that's why I wanted to scream PPO three. Yeah. Feel me? You know what I'm saying? At the end of practice, yeah. whatever. Like, but I mean, once you got, once I got older and became, you know, more wise and, and a little bit more mature, I understand. I understood why they didn't want me to go there, and uh, not necessarily that Dunbar was a bad school or anything like that. I just felt like, you know, one, I wanted to eventually because I didn't. It's complicated explaining this. I it was like I I was I understood why they didn't want me to go there and I had frustrations with it. But after a while, it was like you know I get a chance to go build my own legacy somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, I never wanted to be one of them kids that they try to say you know if I took somebody's spot on the basketball team, if I started on the basketball team or whatever success I got, I really ain't want to play for my dad. Like I really didn't. That, that was never a goal of mine to play for my father. Um, so I I I I embraced the the new uh, challenge and opportunity that my my people thought I should and I should take and uh, I left Dunbar the goals the dreams of that behind but I was always still a Dunbar fan like and yeah. wanted to go to Dunbar even when I was at Gilman but I had to keep that under wraps of course but you know it was definitely yeah. a decision but they really didn't you know pressure me or anything like I think it it just kind of happened naturally because I was a smart kid and I understood why yeah yeah. I definitely get it, man. It's something that, you know, it's it's an energy in that building and I and you know, through the conversation that we've had, like I know the feeling and it's one of the reasons why I left, you know, to to finish out at Dunbar. Mm -hmm. But um as as we get to this this transition to Gilman, like I mean, you're in a whole new world, you know. Um just understand the dynamics of uh, you know, Gilman, there's not a lot of African American there. Like most of the African Americans that are there, like from my understanding, it's a lot of athletes, correct? Yeah, they are. But I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like all the ones that was there, you know, was different. I'm gonna just say that they really ain't come from really. that environment. Yeah, we just grew up in two different environments, I guess you could say. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So, as as you made that transition, like, um, how how long did it truly take for you to adjust to, you know, and and kind of adapt to, you know, this new space that you was in, Le coming from Leaf Walk and then going into a place where, you know, Leaf Walk was what, 98 percent black, 99. If yeah. not a hundred percent black. If not a um, and then called yeah. Shane, I went there for middle school. Right. I mean, that was a Catholic school, but you know how some Catholic schools are in Baltimore, like they might as well be public school, you feel me? Right. Um, yeah. So that was majority black as well. Um mm -hmm. so yeah, basically all black schools my whole life. And then just right. going to Gilman. Definitely a big uh adjustment. And I didn't mention this, but I actually so once I left middle school, I didn't actually go, I didn't go right to high school. So once I chose Gilman as a high school, because my, I got a late birthday, um, my parents thought it would be a good idea. And along with some people at Gilman thought it would be a good idea socially. Uh, I, I agreed as well. I really didn't mind to reclass it and do eighth grade again. So I did eighth grade twice. Didn't fail or anything like that. I always had A's and B's, but it was more so on, you know, with me having a late birthday, and me transitioning into a extremely different social environment, you know what I'm saying, and giving me that extra year to kind of adjust to make it be as beneficial as possible. Like we had came to that decision, so I left college. And that was that was spent at Gilman, right? Yeah. So yeah, I so I technically did five years. I did five years at Gilman. So another eighth grade year, and then all the high school. Okay. All right, so you, you get to Gilman, and I just remember um during this time frame, like, I knew you were good, and at this, at this portion of my life, I might have been, you know, I was away in college, and, you know, anything Baltimore athletes or sports, I try to keep up with, and, you know, um, Cyrus is, is like family. He, he is family, and um I follow his journey, and when I start to see, like, the, like, you know, they have a ranking system, you know, throughout um, high school sports. And as I'm following, of course, you have, have Tavon Austin that, that led the way. Cyrus came a little after Tavon Austin. But after Tavon Austin at this time, um, Cyrus was literally the best thing in the city. Um, uh, when he came out, he was a five star, which is the highest rated star that you can be on any um, recruiting website. And as I'm following his journey, I'm just like, wow. Like I, I had no idea. I knew you were like special. I knew you were special. But 
when I seen like the paper, the news clippings and the thing that you were doing, I was just like, I was, for one, I was so proud of you and I was so happy for you just to see this kid who I knew, you know, you know, randomly up when I line with, uh, you know, my team, we might've seemed like giants to him at a time where he has now become a giant. So you get to Gilman and is it, is it the superstar treatment that you had to work? Like, what is this process when you first step on the field? Cause you, you played basketball, football, you ran track. It wasn't baseball, right? No baseball at the time, right? No, I played baseball up to my sophomore. Oh, you played baseball too? So, yeah. Okay. So, so, I mean, definitely wasn't no superstar treatment. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it, it got, it, it went in stages. So, I mean, eighth grade, that was a rough point for me just because I was, you know, transitioning to a world I'd never been in. I was young, a little bit immature, really didn't know how to navigate the the situations I was being put in um socially uh like i said i was blessed uh academically you know that i was smart in school it didn't really come as a big challenge to me thankfully mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying because i know you know what i'm saying there's people out here that struggle with school don't like school i mean i really didn't like school per se i mean it came easy and i did what i had to do so i would have to so i could please my parents and you know get into college one day and you know what i'm saying had that process go smooth i definitely I won't, you know, say I knew what I wanted to do from the very beginning. So a lot of my issues, I say, with school came socially when I first got there, you know, just not being not knowing how to maneuver certain. Like I said, social situation that I've never been put in dealing with different races, cultures um, Mm -hmm. and things of that nature, man. And just really trying to embrace my opportunity that I had that I really couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel a lot of times. and felt like, you know, I was getting discriminated against um, and judged based on, you know, one, what I looked like, two, the things I was good at, you know what I'm saying? I felt like uh, it was a known thing when I came there that, you know, I was kind of like the, the fresh new star athlete on campus, regardless mm-hmm. if I was in high school or not, like people already knew who I was and things of that nature. So I, I would just remember like little instances like, We'll be playing because at eighth grade we still had like a recess time because it was middle mm-hmm. school. So I just remember like playing a little, playing at recess and stuff like that, little games, blacktop basketball, whatever, like just normal stuff, and like being just better than everybody. Not really that I was trying to like go super hard at you know recess, but mm-hmm. I remember getting told like getting brought to the office saying that I was bullying kids. You know what I'm saying? Because like I'm like bullying kids i'm like just because i'm you know a little bit better than them or might be a little bit more you know physically big or gifted i I remember a lot of like it was a lot of things like that that i really had to go through um and it's way more than that but i really had to learn how to you know just take take uh the punches you know what i'm saying i understand you know not everybody like that there's going to be situations like that and like i said this was my time preparing me for the real world because you know what I'm saying? We was going. I was going to eventually deal with a lot more things like this when I got out of high school and college, and everything. So it was definitely a big, you know, transition for a kid, for a 14 year old kid at the time. Right. So, so you make that adjustment, and they they know who you are. You put the work in, and you eventually, like I like I was saying, um, you eventually, you know, become what well, at the time. What what were you rated? You know, your senior year. In um, high school, I think I was I was like top twenty in the country. So and I top was, twenty, I was, I was like a, I was like, yeah, top twenty in the country, and I think I was like the number, like a top five rated athlete. You know what I'm saying? Right. Overall, and, and that just meant that I played both defense and offense. Okay, and so you, at, at this time, you 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 weather the storm. Um, you know, that eighth grade year was kind of rough for you, but you, you settled in, you found your way. Um, were there any particular like friends or teachers that helped you along the way, like make that transition or how did you finally feel comfortable, you know, um, you know, during like this time period before you got to your senior year? Oh yeah, it was definitely, um, it was teachers and it was, you know, my peers, my friends. Um, one guy that everybody probably know that's on here is Darius Jennings. Uh, he was at Gilman with me at the time, a year older than me. Um, and he had actually been like a Gilman lifer. Like he, Gilman, uh, Darius was there from like second, first or second grade. 
So okay. by the time I met him, he was a freshman in high school. So he had, you know, it was nothing to him. He had been there his whole life. So just kind of building a relationship with him amongst other people and just, you know, trying to figure out how to maneuver through, you know, life at a different school, different world, things of that nature. And just, you know what I'm saying? Um, kind of, he took me under his wing and as a little bro and just, you know, tried to show me the ropes as much as he could. Um, mm -hmm. As well as some teachers, you know, I can name, you know, my coaches as well, uh, Mr. Foreman, Johnny Foreman. Um, he was one of, he was our track coach and one of our uh, football coaches, um, a black man. I uh, had taught at Gilman for, I don't want to get any numbers wrong, but, you know, longer than I was alive. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, having a familiar face like that around, I mean, it was plenty of other, you know what I'm saying? I could go on and on and on. Um, like I said, just leaning on the people who I had accessible to me, trying to use my resources just to make myself as successful as possible, um, regardless of stuff I was dealing with. And I definitely had people to go to bed for me. Uh, I only want to want to shout out uh, my advisor from high school, uh, Italian lady named Loretta Tassoni, probably the nicest person I ever met in high school. She was one of the people I said, you know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, it didn't really just stop in eighth grade. Like, I had issues going forth in high school, too. Well, I was just, mm -hmm. I was misunderstood. I guess that's what I felt. But looking back on it, I got a different perspective of what was going on. But like I said, she definitely went to bat for me. Um, and being that she was a white lady at the time, and I was dealing with a lot of issues with Caucasian people. Like, that was, that felt good, you know what I'm saying? That, you know, and we gained a close relationship. Um, but her and amongst a couple others, like I said, I mean, I definitely had a, a, a good support system up there to help. Okay, so let's 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 take it right to it, man. Like you're you're a five star athlete. Um, you had your senior year. You weathered the storm. You stayed mentally tough. You stayed focused. Um, your GPA at this time is what? I got three point four or something like that. People. So you're a qualifier, three point four um GPA, um. And all I remember, I just remember this one headline, this one clipping. They say Saban is in Baltimore. <laughs> and but for those who don't know, this is uh, Nick Saban. Um, I'm going to just say, if you don't know, just Google it. I, I wouldn't do the man no justice um, to how revered he is in college football and college sports. But just speaking on, you know, what I've seen, um, I, I checked BaltimoreSun.com. Uh, I'm, I'm in college somewhere, probably in my dorm room. And it says uh, Saban comes to Baltimore and Saban, Nick Saban comes to Baltimore on a helicopter. Uh, I'm not sure if that part is true, but because I've seen clippings of it. But did he, did he come in a helicopter? Nah, he ain't coming. I don't think he came in a helicopter. I mean, of course, he probably caught a private jet to get there. But nah, he went. He ain't do it, it like that. I never used to do it. He ain't do it all that. But OK, I so nah, they he say to, but he just pulled up to one of my basketball games. Right. So they say Saban, Saban comes to Baltimore for, for Cyrus Jones. And um during that time it was it was it was I mean super big. I don't think Nick Nick Saban had ever been to Baltimore to recruit a kid. So to have Nick Saban come to your high school and uh recruit you, what was that like? Uh that was definitely uh a moment that I was proud of. Um and you know what I'm saying? I just I, I guess you could say that's when I, I won't say that's when I knew I had kind of like reached a certain level, but I was like, I, I mean, I was conscious. I was like, yeah, he don't do this for everybody, I'm sure. Right. So, I, I mean, it definitely made me feel good, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, I was getting recognized and, um, and I'm going to just be straight up. Like, I knew I was getting hated on by a lot of people at Gilman and it made me feel real good that, you know, I could throw that in their face. <laughs> that's just me being a G, straight up. <laughs> So, I mean, okay. like, but, uh, cause I mean, it's, it's real, bro. Like, you know, the stuff that go on out here and what I was going through back then, a lot of people don't know. Cause it really, like all they seen was the accolades and everything like that, but they really gave me a hard time up there, bro. So yeah, I felt real good, man, that I could really, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it was a good moment for my family. Um, mm -hmm. And like I said myself personally, that I, that I I could see my hard work, her hard work coming to fruition. And it's a mm -hmm. fun fact about that day it was actually two coaches in there at the same time. So mm -hmm. 
uh, Ohio State interim coach at the time, Luke Fickle, was actually sitting on the other side of the gym uh, okay. with Saban. So that, and that actually turned out to be kind of one of the reasons I didn't really go to Ohio State just because my parents ain't really uh, like that because we had just seen him a, a day before and told him not, and could he please not come because we knew right. Saban was visiting me and he chose to show up anyway. So that was kind of a disrespectful thing. So Ohio State had kind of lost some points. That was funny. I remember that. But uh, but yeah, man. I mean, it was cool, definitely. Um, but of course, I try not to, you know, think too much of it. Just trying mm-hmm. to keep doing what I was doing before worry about school. And one play the game that I was playing that he came to watch play. So I couldn't, you know, think about that too much. Okay. So you you ultimately you chose to uh you know after you graduated you ultimately chose to go to the University of Alabama on a full football scholarship and um when you committed you were originally what you were considered an athlete at the time because you went both ways but when you landed at Alabama you you started out as a freshman as a wide receiver correct yeah so th- when I committed um coach had basically just uh gave it, gave me the uh, choice to you know, decide what I wanted to play starting off, you know. He wanted me to play DB because that's that's what he loves and that's his side of the ball that he, you know, is passionate about. And he really thought I could be a great DB. You know what I'm saying? I guess I turned out okay. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, so, yeah, but I wanted the ball in my hand. Tavon was my favorite player, uh, one of them, you know. But mm-hmm. the guy that I – imitated a lot and tried to do a lot of things he did when I was on offense and had the ball in my hand. Um, so I wanted to try to see what I could do on, on that level. And, you know, I think just the coordinator at the time, we was running a pro style offense. I was, I wasn't really a polished receiver. I was more so a slot guy trying to learn the position. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't think I was really put in the right position to, you know, learn and grow. And I feel like, you know, I feel like, when Lane Kiffin came, if I was at if I was at receiver, it would have been a much better fit. Maybe he mm-hmm. he's one of those players. I mean, uh, coordinators that gets players in space like that, and didn't really run a pro style. Like he just, you know what I'm saying, run and gun, try to get the best players the ball. And I felt like that would fit me. So, but offense didn't really work out. And even though I got some time and I played a lot on special teams and made some big plays in the return game and stuff like that, but after that year, coach had came to me once we had beat Notre Dame and we were losing like our two starting corners. And mm-hmm. he was just like, you know, you already know I wanted you to play DB anyway, but we losing, it was D Milner who went top 10 that year. And um, I can't even remember off the top of my head. Uh, I think Dion Blue was leaving too, but I can't remember, I might be wrong. Um, but anyway, it was an opportunity for me to play right away and he wanted to see uh, if I would be willing to experiment for the springtime going into my sophomore year. Okay, so let me stop you right there. Your, your freshman year, right? You know, you you make this transition from Baltimore to Alabama. Um, you get a, you get some time build, but this first way the guy. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. like the first time. It's the first time. It's like you're not the guy. Like you get some reps. You showing that your athletic ability, but. Who was in that? Who was in that wide receiver room with you? Because you guys also won a national championship that year. Who was in that room? Please, please tell the guests like who were the wide receivers that you were playing with and beyond. Well, I feel like the most notable one will obviously be Amari Cooper. He we was in right. the same class at the time, so he we came both came in as a freshman. Mm-hmm. Um, together, um, we had DeAndre White. Uh, mm-hmm. not a real big name, but he was great. Great player, went to the league. Um, I'm not sure everybody's accolades and where they got drafted, but a lot of these guys end up playing in the league. Kevin mm-hmm. Newell, who was a senior at the time. Um, we had Kenny Bell. Like I said, I was a freshman, so I feel like going that far back, a lot of people, unless you were a serious Bama fan, you wouldn't really know. But it honestly wasn't a star-studded receiver room at the time. Um, mm-hmm. Omari ended up being the biggest name, you know, that came out. And he had a great freshman year, but I mean, at that time, it was really like uh, um, a group effort. You know what I'm right. saying? Like he was, yeah. like he he became the guy towards the end of the year, just because you know he ended up ex- just showing what he could do, getting the opportunities, and taking advantage of them. 
and like I say, he's Amari Cooper. Everybody know what he's about now. But back then, you know what I'm saying? Everybody was fighting for opportunity. Right. Okay. So you uh coach comes to you, he says, Man, you know I, I coach DBs, my favorite position. I want you to make that transition back to becoming a cornerback um during your sophomore year. So um from my understanding, like during your sophomore year, you make the transition, you're learning the speed of the game. Um, the difference is from high school to college and playing DB. You know, you're playing in the uh in the most dominant, most physically athletic athletically gifted athletes um, go to the SEC, which is the uh, conference for those who may not know. Um, you're seeing guys, you know, that that are, you know, their whole life they train to go to the league, you know. Um, yeah. Some colleges you go to, uh, some colleges you go to, you like, uh, you know, you go into school, you play football, you go to school, you're going to go get a job later. But if right. you go to these type of schools, you know, for the most part, the majority of the team wants to, um, you know, go to the NFL. So you get to Bama, um, when you get, you know, outside of your sophomore year, when did you feel like you were ready as a defensive back to play in the SEC? Was it your junior year? Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. My sophomore year, it's crazy just thinking about it. Like, I never really, that whole year was like such a roller coaster just because I felt like um, I was thrown into the fire. Uh, I had to learn to, I had one, I had to learn the playbook first quickly. Mm -hmm. I think that came, it was hard, but I, I made it happen, you know, just putting in the work. Um, then I had to one, just get used to playing a position again. I wasn't going backwards for a whole year. You know what I'm saying? I was on the other side of the bus. So just getting the movements and everything just back down, it came quick, but of course being able to do it and have it look good on air and being able to do it against the top people in the country, two different things. So I'm learning the defense, I'm learning the position again and even stuff I never even knew before. And then, you know, of course, I know people trying to take my spot because, <laughs> like, I mean, I was in a vulnerable position. I felt like, you know, I was young. I'm learning something new at the top level. I know it's guys that's waiting for me to make one mistake because, you know, they get that opportunity, so on and so forth. And then, you know, those those games come where you're on the biggest stage playing against the best guys. Like, I had some moments where I did great things, of course, and but my inconsistency showed just because, you know, I felt like I was I was never comfortable. And I was, right. so, I was still in such a learning phase at the time, and, and you know what I'm saying? I was playing not to make mistakes versus mm -hmm. me being confident and knowing what I know and my preparation and things of that nature. Um, Later on, I could just go out there and play free, and I think that's what my junior year really showed. You know what I'm saying? That mm -hmm. I, my my kind of my trials and tribulations from sophomore year they kind of made me tougher, and I just use it as a learning a learning experience and and, and bust my butt in the off season. And like I said, and there's another key factor to that. Uh, I want to give him his flowers also while he on while I'm on here. The guy that really made my transition what it was from my sophomore year to my junior year uh, is um, Azar Abdul Rahim. He's mm -hmm. a DB coach, uh, head DB coach at Boston College right now. And at the time, he was on Bama staff. He had just, you know, got a position. He was a longtime coach at Friendship Collegiate in DC, a high school program that did great. And a deep, basically a DB specialist from the DMV area, well respected from DC. And we graded, we we bonded when he came down there. He was down there as a, like a GA, um, just learning. And we bonded, and he 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 helped me put in that work. We got together all the time, watched film together. And I say he definitely uh, is. I would say no nobody but him is the reason that you know I made that jump from my junior to my senior. I mean my my sophomore to my junior year. So my nice. guys I always love. So let's fast forward, man. Like you, you put in the work, um, getting it done. You made that transition. You see the speed. Um, you're back to being yourself. You have a phenomenal senior year. Um, you do your thing. I think you lead the nation in punt return touchdowns, correct? Um, all conference uh, defensive back again, correct? I, I actually, so it's funny. My junior year was my best statistical year, and I made all conference. And then my senior year, I really didn't have a lot of picks. Um, mm -hmm. But I felt like I played way better football than I did my 
junior year and I was just way mentally on another level than I was my junior year. And obviously right. uh, I got my opportunity on punt return and stuff like that. So that helped right. me as well. But yeah. Yeah. And, and it showed, it, it seemed like your senior year, you made like every critical play and big time play and big time moments. It seemed like you just seemed to show up. And um, that spoke like that. One of those moments that I vividly remember was sitting in a bar somewhere and I'm watching um, 2015 uh, semifinal game against uh, Michigan State. And you got the pick, took it back, took it to the house. I'm like, I'm losing my, I lost it. Like I lost it. I well, think at halftime, but I got the punt return. Yeah. Yeah, 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 right. So I'm like, you know, I'm old, man. My memory, man, you know, I you not with me, but. Should I forget sometimes? I'm trying to tell you, I, re I remember that moment where I was just like, yeah, it's, it's time. So, man, I, I was just so happy for you because I'm still getting chills right now and thinking about it because I just, like, you know, you know this person, like, and you're just so happy for him. You had a conversation with him. You know, he come from where I come from. And just to see him, you know, you know, excel at what he loves to do, you root for that person, you, you protect that person, you defend that person at all costs, because those that moment was just it was big for you, but also just watching you and supporting you and, and being your, your uh, family member and brother, you know, what I mean, it was something great to watch. So yeah. I knew your time was coming. So you guys y'all go on to win win everything that year. And then you come you coming up, you go to the uh, NFL combine, and then you ended up selected uh, in the second round to the New England Patriots. So you go from Alabama and now you go to, you know, your pick um, in the second round to go to New England. How does this happen? You won two national championships at Alabama and now you're going to play with Tom Brady and the coach and the owner. And we have a bunch of Patriots fans on here. So to speak about that experience. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, if y'all are real Patriots fans, Y'all might already know how the experience was for me, but uh, yeah, it wasn't really that great of an experience, bro. I mean, I could go on and on. We could probably talk a whole hour about that, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, you know, for a lot of reasons, it just really wasn't a great experience. Um, and there was a lot of reasons I just didn't play well at all. I felt like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a crazy time for me, bro. Like that, that whole time period. Uh, yeah. It felt like, you know, I was at the top of the world getting drafted. Uh second round in my hometown, all that, you know, felt like my dreams that came true and stuff. I and mean, they did, you know. Uh mm -hmm. a big big in a big way. And I was able to, you know, definitely change the trajectory of my, my, my family life mm -hmm. in an instant, you know what I'm saying? And that, that felt good and it, and I had to worry about things. Uh, that we used to for a second. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I was grateful, man, in that moment, just mm -hmm. getting drafted. Like I said, I just felt like all my hard work was was um, paying off. Like I said, um, I just wanted to go. One, I, I just wanted to go uh, make everybody proud, you know what I'm saying, that played a part in, you know, my journey and helping me get there. And um, like I said, um, but when I got there, you know, I mean, it started off well, but of course I had my challenges and, uh, but I mean, good times and bad, you know, I feel like that's just life, you know, unfortunately my yeah. happen, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. The NFL and, and things of that nature, but, um, definitely was a tough time for me. Right. So going to, um, you know, just following the story, you know, you, you get to new England, you know, things didn't turn out so well for you when you get to the league, you know, you've been a, you know, tremendous athlete your whole life. Um, you won on every single level. Uh, like you said, you changed the trajectory of your family's legacy as far as on in generational terms with you being selected to the NFL. You get to New England, things don't really work out for you on the field, you know, uh, and then you get hurt the following year, you know, you tear your ACL. And so, you know, you're having back-to-back, -back, you know, traumatic years where it's like, okay, what's next for me? And um, you're in this position now where as though you're becoming a man. You see that, you know, this is not going to be easy. You know, I didn't have my best rookie season. Um, you know what I mean? I, I fell short, you know, there. Then I come back feeling great, doing some good things in the off season to prepare for the next step. I end up, tearing, you turn your ACL, and then you have to be out another year. So the third year you come back, you know, you do some great things, but you end up leaving New England, and then you end up transitioning to uh, Baltimore Ravens, right? Yeah. So when you get to Baltimore, I know, like, being a Baltimore guy, like, how how excited for one you got a fresh start like so 
you left you left all those negative things in Boston um in New England all right you come to Baltimore you get a fresh start um how was that for you uh it was definitely exciting you know what I'm saying definitely at that time I needed something to you know be happy about and look forward to you know I had never been cut before <laughs> so that was a first that was a first time for me so definitely a humbling experience you know feeling what that was like and uh just having the opportunity to come home you know and be embraced in baltimore was cool and i was thankful for it for sure and um scored my my mm -hmm. only nfl touchdown in baltimore so i mean that's cool i get to say that forever uh Right. But yeah, man, I mean, it was it was a good time in Baltimore. You know what I'm saying? A dream come true for a Baltimore kid. I mean, I'm I felt like uh, I was living out the dreams of a lot of my, you know, people that I once looked up to and people who was looking up to me. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And um, so I definitely uh, just tried to make the most of it and you know embrace whatever opportunities I got. Okay. And like I, I do remember that time in Baltimore, I was extremely happy. You know, like one of my guys playing for my favorite team ever. You know, wherever you were, I'm gonna root for you and cheer for you, of course. But you know, like you being on my hometown team, my favorite team, it's just a different feeling. Where so I can always cheer, like all the time. You know what I mean? Sure. I'm not just watching, you know, Cyrus play on this team, and that's my favorite player on that team. I'm watching one of my favorite players play for my favorite team. So I enjoyed those times and those moments. Um, and then you get to Baltimore and a lot of people may not know this next thing I'm about to ask you about. Um, a lot of my colleagues may not know where though you're making this transition right now, still to this day that, you know, your career kind of ended because of you had, you know, you found, I want you to tell the story uh, as far in regards to your health. And this story is, you know, not well known, but, you know, I kind of know it on the reasons, a lot of the reasons why, you know, Cyrus is currently, you know, not playing anymore in the NFL. So basically my second year, so. Uh, the whole health situation kind of started actually after my first year in Baltimore, but it was like two unrelated situations, but one kind of led to the discovery of the other. So at the end of my first year in Baltimore, we, that was the year we lost to the, the Chargers early. Mm -hmm. first, Lamar, Lamar first playoff game, right? Yeah. So really, you know, I was just having a normal off season, traveling around, doing whatever, vacationing, just enjoying, you know, time away from ball before it was time to start training again. And I came, I was, I went, actually went back up to my spot in Boston for a while after the season, came back to Baltimore to train. Once I got back, um, I ended up getting a blood clot, like out of nowhere. Um, like, uh, I went to train one morning this was warming up and like I got short of breath, and was feeling weird. Uh, went to the hospital. They told me I had a blood clot. Um, and they thought it, you know, just basically came from, I th they thought I, cause I did a lot of traveling in a short amount of time. So, you know, not stretching your legs, sitting down for a long time, stuff like that. They basically told me that could have been the reason why. Mm -hmm. Think nothing of it, like just a freak accident. So I go on like blood thinners for three months. And I don't do spring ball with the Ravens at all. So I can't even really, I can't even exercise. A lot mm -hmm. of people didn't even know this. Like I didn't do no spring ball um, going into my second season. So that was 2000 and I want to say 18, 19, or mm -hmm. 19 to 20. That was, it was 19 to 20 season, I think, but I can't remember it. Unimportant. But find out to get a blood clot, get everything situated. I get healthy for the season. I play eight games with the Ravens, get cut um, after eight games, get immediately picked up by the Broncos. So I'm in, I go to Denver um, and I'm out there and I get out there, you know, the coaches, of course, if anybody's been to Denver, you know, they tell you about the elevation, you know, the elevation levels are super high compared to, you know, ours here on the East Coast. Um, but get out there and practicing for like a week before I suit up and get ready for game. Um, everything's going fine. I'm good, feeling good, excited about it. You know, new opportunity, new team. And I just thought, you know, nothing that I, nothing concerning. I get like bloated one day after practice and I go like ask for some like Pepsi or something like to just settle my stomach. They knew about my blood clot situation that I had a few months prior to me even getting out there. So they say, you know, you're bloated. Uh, we was going to have a a long flight back across country to play the, the Bills. 
the next day. So they was like, you know, you had a blood clot before. We about to make a long flight. I know what you're saying, but we want to go get this checked out anyway. So they sent me to get an emergency CT scan, an MRI on my chest. Um, turns out I didn't have no blood clots, which I pretty much knew I didn't. But he was like, uh, you don't have any blood clots, but we see something funny on the right side of your chest. So I'm like, all right, <laughs> okay. So he was like, we'll tell you, we'll take some more uh, look at it tonight and we'll just talk to you at the facility tomorrow. So I go pack my bags like I'm traveling to the game tomorrow, uh, the next day thinking nothing of it, get to the facility, go through a couple of meetings. And they pull me aside, like in between one of our meetings. Uh, and I walk in, you know how you walk into a room and you kind of already know that it's about to be some bad news. So like literally all the trainers was in there and like the head trainer, I'm like, what's going on? Like, all right. So I sit down and they basically just tell me like, they was like, you know, we took some more looks at the pictures we saw. Um, and the doctor thinks it could be blah, 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 blah. blah. Um, so I, I ended up going through like a series of tests. So I didn't travel to the game. They basically told me that this issue would need to be sorted out before I could play. Um, so I didn't travel to the game and the following week when the team came back, I really just spent that whole week kind of going to see different doctors and then getting to the bottom of my situation. And basically was confirmed that I had what was called an anomalous coronary right artery. So something else congenital and I was born with and that people that I've been living with for 26 years at the time. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. So we start talking about the treatment options and everything like that. So basically it was determined that in order for me to one, uh, live an active lifestyle and exercise and everything like that without risk, because I'm at my greatest risk when I'm my, my heart rate is elevated. So that's literally me doing my job every day. Like mm -hmm. Going out there, shooting up every day, even just jogging on the treadmill. Jog. Anytime my heart rate is elevated, I'd be at a risk for a sudden collapse, sudden death, anything like that. Wouldn't nobody ever knew what was wrong with me. So wow. he's, uh, the doctors basically say, like I said, in order to live a healthy lifestyle, let alone be able to give myself a chance to play again, I would definitely need open heart surgery to fix it. So hearing that was crazy. Um, and I mean, it was crazy, but you know, I ain't, I ain't break down the tears or nothing like that. You know, being from Baltimore, I guess, I don't know. It was just like, I couldn't even wrap my head around it at first. So I, he being emotional really didn't really sink in until kind of, I had time to reflect, but yeah, from that, from, I think that was maybe like December 5th, December 6th. And I went home that weekend, came back and on the 11th, I had my surgery, bro. So like within me finding out, I say, oh, le less than a week and a half, sorry. Less than a week and a half of me finding out about this, I was under the knife, mm -hmm. open heart surgery, completely healthy before, no symptoms or anything, nothing. Ever in life. Ever in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So I want to get into this chat, man. This chat been blowing up, man. The people definitely want to hear from you. And, you know, I appreciate you sharing that last tidbit with us, but we're going to make our, our ending and transition based off of that story. But I want, I want to get into the chat. Guys, if you have any, any questions or any, any responses to this, like, please start posting them. I'm going to get, I'm going to try to get to them all because it's definitely a lot in here. Let's just start, let's start at the top. And I'm an open book too, so tell people don't be shy with their questions. <laughs> Mark Coleman, I'm not sure. He said the Edwards brothers may be may debate the greatest high school team in, in team theory. <laughs> uh Mary, Mary says, go Greyhounds. All right. Um, Mary also says, uh, was your treat treatment different from Gilman to Bama? If so, how? My treatment, like how I felt I was being treated at school. Yes. Yes. Oh yeah, I definitely say so, for sure. At Bama, you you basically glorify, you love. They love us down there. We, you know, biggest show in town. Gilman, you know what I'm saying? Everybody wanted to, you know, they thought I was just, I they thought I was just a football player. I guess I ain't had nothing else to offer the school, so I wasn't really embraced until you know, coaches and a lot of other stuff started happening and coming to the school. At least that's how I felt and took it, but. Not by everyone. Of course, I had people I loved there as well. But um, it was kind of breaking up a little bit on my end. 
But uh, and I was just I'm, I'm gonna go to the next question because we heard the um, we heard the gist of it. Um, Andre Clark says top player. In the... Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. It's like breaking. You good now though? Okay. Um, Andre was saying um, top player in the country, straight out of Baltimore City, Gilman, Roll Tide, Clamp, Clampington, <laughs> <laughs> Super Bowl in New England, played for hometown Ravens, questioned them as one of the top punt returns in the National Football League. Let's go. Open heart surgery, back to the NFL with the Broncos, and you're not even 30 years old. You're clearly a champion, an obstacle overcomer, an inspiration for the old and young. Salute. Appreciate that, Andre. Thank you. Of course, Bob. Bob loves his Patriots, so I'm pretty sure he's familiar. He says, Pats, P A T S. <laughs> Marry again. Um, no she asks, How are you coping? She says, uh, How are you coping with how your life is now with that condition? Oh, I mean, I'm great. I try to play. Um, so that's what people don't know, too. So I really, so from the moment I say that my sternum held up, and so I had to wait six, after my surgery, I had to wait and I actually had a setback. So I had my surgery and I stayed in the hospital for like five days. And then I ended up catching a blood clot. I had to go back in the hospital. I was there for Christmas and a whole bunch of other stuff. Then I eventually got to go home. But then in March, I, my sternum had healed. Like I did like six weeks. Once that healed, I was, I could hit the ground running as much as my body could take. So I started slowly know training and working out and i say i was ready to i got cleared to play football again and get um trials from teams and stuff maybe like less than a year after my surgery i want to say it was like seven or eight months Mm -hmm. months because that was one of the things that helped me back too a lot of teams thought it was a little bit too early for such a big surgery that i had so they were skeptical about signing me but I gave it a shot. So I'm I'm completely healthy right now. I don't take any medicine. Um, I work out. I personal train in Atlanta. I sell real estate down here. So, I mean, God is great. That's all I can say. And I'm blessed to be here to talk to y'all. I'm good. Cyrus is good. So, yeah. So you, you kind of answered one of my, my, next, my next questions. It was just... Um... What, was, what, what are you up to now? You explained that you dabble in the real estate. Um, you're a certified personal trainer down there um, in the Atlanta area. Um, and I just want to say, man, like, I got, you know, I have the utmost respect for you, not only as a friend and a brother, but as a person, a genuine person. And um, I truly appreciate you sharing that story because I know for a fact that that story, a lot of people don't know the ins and outs of what you just shared with us. Um, and how you grew up and, you know, started in Baltimore and the triumphs that you went through. So I'm, I'm so happy and appreciative that you gave Baltimore County Recreation and Parks, um, you know, the government, some time with us tonight, man. And I'm pretty sure that all of my colleagues agree that we appreciate you sharing your story. Um, they, they, they're clapping for you right now. Okay. Love you. I appreciate y'all. Computing so, so that's why I'm trying to plug it up. Hold on. Okay. All right, we good. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, as again, man, like I said, like I'm, I'm gonna give you the flowers that you deserve because you deserve them. You accomplished something that a lot of us dream and only wish and pray to do. Um, you're one of the greatest men that I know. You're a great father, a great friend, a great son. Um, and I just want to let you know, like, man, we appreciate all you do and all you've done for us. Um, I appreciate your time, brother, and I wish you nothing but the best moving forward. Um, where can everyone follow you at on social media and keep up with the things that you're doing? All right, so I'm on Instagram more than anything. Um, so my main page is Cyrus Jones Jr., no underscores or anything like that. Uh, actually, Cy, C-Y Jones Jr. Um, that's my main page. My real estate page is CyrusJones.atl on IG. My personal training page is Cyrus uh, J Fit on Instagram. And I think that's about it. I don't really use Facebook uh, or anything like that. So y'all can catch me on Instagram. Um, and yeah, look out for, you know, things I'm doing with my foundation uh, back in Baltimore soon. Um, if y'all ever in Atlanta, need anything, 
know anybody that's moving, relocating, or doing anything like that to Atlanta, feel free to reach out. And if you in Atlanta and want to get some work in, personal training wise, reach out to me as well. So, yeah, yeah. I know uh, we we don't have our director on, but we have Bob on, and we have Courtney, we have Ben, Chris, like a lot of um about leadership team on board, man. And I'm pretty sure if you ever want to, you know, do anything with Baltimore County Recreation and Parks, um, you know, have your clinics, your foundation, use some of our parks. I'm pretty sure that you will be invited and you'll, you'll have the green light when it comes to that. So if you ever need anything from us, man, don't don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I'm glad that we were able to, uh, you know, bring you on board. Like they're still going crazy in the, trap, the, uh, the uh, chat. And so, man, I, like I said, man, I just want to honor you and give you your, your flowers, man. Hey, Bob Smith, he said for sure. He like anytime you need anything from Baltimore County Recreation and Parks, just reach out. Um, man, all of my colleagues, we really, really appreciate you. I want to keep on saying that, man. Thank you for taking an hour out of your time to come sit with us and share your story. It was incredible. Um, and, and I'll be calling you again, man. I want to thank everybody for tuning in this week. Um, uh, we're going to move into Women's History Month next week and honor some amazing women. And uh, we'll continue this series going. But Cyrus, thank you for being the finale for our Black History Month Speaker Series. And I'm going to say thank you, guys. I uh, appreciate everyone for tuning in and supporting me and this new thing we're trying to create um, over the last four weeks. And I'm glad we ended it the way we ended. Cyrus, man, I'll talk to you later. And to all my colleagues, I appreciate everybody that tuned in. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And appreciate the questions. Yeah. Take care. All right, buddy.